Thank you. Just hoping you can uh, hear me without me having to get you all fine. Hear me? Um, so, in the program, you have some program notes. And I thought it would be wise uh, in the time that I have to not repeat myself. Uh, I already told you some things in the program notes. So I hope you have a chance to read them. I hope you also have a chance to read through the translations of the texts of the vocal pieces that you're hearing tonight. And I would give you the hint that um, if you don't read it before the show, it's going to be very difficult to read it during the show because the lights are down because of the images, and it's a be quite a beautiful atmosphere, but if you're hoping to follow the text closely, um, good luck with that. Um, anyway, but so I thought what I would do is just uh, make a few notes, uh, mental notes for you, so that as you're listening to this program, there will be things that you will pick up on, things to listen for. I am not a musicologist, I am a musician, uh, and so even though, yes, I studied music history at school, I don't want to give you a lot of sort of musical history details and go into depth analysis of these pieces. Um, I just want to give you some pointers, things to listen for, um, and a little bit of information about how this program came to be, which is how I'll start. Um, Fresco Baldi has been somebody that I have always been interested in since I was in my early 20s. And uh, I was al I've always been surprised that more people don't play Frescobaldi. It seemed to me that the only people that had heard about him were keyboard players, specifically organists and harpsichordists. And this is because he wrote a lot of music for the instruments they play. His job was primarily as a keyboard player and as a church musician, but he seems to have really been into playing music and writing music to be played as opposed to doing a lot of writing for the church. He wrote some music for the church, but not a lot considering how long he was employed at St. Peter's in Rome. Um, anyway, uh, I thought, wouldn't it be fun, you know, it would be great to play Frescobaldi. I played his instrumental music because he wrote a few little early sonatas. And uh, one day when I was teaching a course for Ryerson, I thought, okay, I gotta get some other music by him because I'm teaching this class on why he's such a great composer. And I found a recording of his madrigals, which I realized I had never heard before. And uh, I thought they were so beautiful. I had the CD on, I didn't stop playing it. It was sort of on rotate for a while in our house, high rotation in our house. And I, I really thought the Toronto Consort is the one group, probably in Canada, that is really sort of designed to perform this music. And we also have uh, the, war the uh, wherewithal to do other types of Frescobaldi's music as well. We have Paul Jenkins, who is an extremely good keyboard player, as well as a tenor, a very good singer. So great, we can do some keyboard music, and we can do some other music from people, uh, people who might have known Frescobaldi, people who lived at the same time as him in Rome, or whose music was published there, this kind of Roman connection. Uh, so that's how this came to be. Many people, for many people, the most famous name in music history at this time in Italy is Monteverdi. And he certainly is an extremely important composer. And he, uh, by and large, I would say he's probably more important for music history in the Western world than Frescobaldi is, um, basically because of his connection with the development of opera and also because of his madrigals, but there are also these madrigals of Frescobaldi and um, other material. But this period in Italy, so if you think about Monteverdi, you, if you've come to the consort for at least a couple of years, you will have heard our Monteverdi, a couple of Monteverdi productions. Um, and one thing that is so fascinating about Italian music of this time, so we're talking the end of the 16th century, crossing over into the 17th century, it's a very, very important time because Stylistic things are shifting in music to a great extent. It is known that in music history exams, if you answer the question properly, when does the Baroque era begin? You're supposed to write down 1600. That's the answer to that music history question. However, as we all know, new ideas are often picked up by a couple of visionary people beforehand. And then there are also other people who are not interested in the new stuff, they want to stick with the old stuff, and they're still doing the old stuff 40 years later, 
after most other people have switched. This is the same thing in fashion, it's the same thing in cuisine, everything in human life. There are some people who are at the forefront and some people who are, they like the old way. They don't want to move on to the new until they absolutely have to. Anyway, this period in, in music history is so important because of this transfer, this shift. And when we talk about this shift, we usually use a couple of terms which are handy to bandy around at the next cocktail party you're at. You have stile antico, the old style, and stile moderno, the new style, the modern style. You also have something called prima pratica, which is the first practice or the first way of doing things, and seconda pratica, the second way or the, the subsequent way of doing things. And um, I've chosen a couple of pieces in the program tonight to help point that out. Um, the first ensemble vocal music that you will hear tonight are two movements from Palestrina's Missa Brevis. Very, very beautiful music. And Palestrina is a very important figure in church history, particularly in Rome, in the 16th century. He's kind of the generation before Frescobaldi. But Palestrina is also an example of this sort of old style of writing. And it's a beautiful style of writing, but if you are trying to follow the text, it gets very hard because everybody's saying, every voice is saying the text at a different time. Um, and so this, develop, this, this count, kind of counterpoint, where we talk about counterpoint, the interweaving of the lines, it's not just musical interweaving, it's also the text gets interwoven. And um, so, for example, if you're telling a story um, in four parts, it gets very difficult to follow this story. And this was one thing that people began to get quite tired of. This is how you sort of ended up with the old-fashioned way and the new way. People decided at some point, we want to understand the words. And we want music to be the servant of the words. We don't want anymore, this kind of very elegant counterpoint where it's, it's wonderful interweaving, but I don't really understand what the words are, and I can't follow the interweaving very well. I would like to be able to follow the text. And the other thing, the other thing that is a component of this is, is, the, is the development of, uh, because of the importance of the text, the development of word painting, which I'm sure you've all heard about. If you go to Baroque music concerts, you hear about this all the time. So if the text says that you're sad, it should sound sad. It's probably, if it's well written, it will be perhaps slow moving. It might be kind of melancholy in its harmony. Uh, it's, it's, you can change the color of the sound and you also are not expected if the word, if you're singing something about sadness or languishing or death, something like that, you are not supposed to be singing a lot of fast notes or throwing in a lot of clever ornaments because a lot of fast, clever ornaments kind of livens things up. And so particularly if you have the word, I, I'm dying, yo moro, you don't go, yo moro, like this. I mean, why would you do that? Because that sounds like, you're telling me you're dying, but I don't believe it. So it would be, for example, moro, come away like that. And this kind of an effect helps tell. This is not just, you're not just understanding the word, but there's also kind of theatrical, artistic thing that's happening with this word. Similarly, if somebody's singing about how happy they are, it's gonna be pretty fast moving probably. That's where you could throw in some happy ornaments, some sort of happier twiddles, things like this. You could also, you probably have harmony and rhythmic patterns in the music that help depict that. And a lot of this, um, for people listening to early music, you just have to let yourself, uh, let yourself appreciate. If you hear something sounding happy, you're hoping that that's what the text is about. You look down at the text and you should be able to identify these differences in feeling. You should be able to hear the text um, depicted to you symbolically, even if you can't read. Like for example, when the house lights are down. So for example, one of the madrigals is about, uh, oh, how happy I am. Um, a lot of these madrigal texts, for example, they remind me of country and western songs. There are certain things that are, that are um, I know that sounds a little bit strange, but when we think about subjects, 
of popular song texts. It, generally speaking, has to do with love and how either you don't have any and you wish you did, or somebody likes you and you don't like them back. Um, you like somebody but they don't like you. Uh, you used to like somebody and you wish they'd leave you alone. <laughs> You're married to this person but you actually quite fancy that other person, what are you gonna do? And this is very much like popular songs today and I always think of country and western because country and western songs are like that. It's always about she loves me, I don't love her, I love her, she doesn't love me. Um, I love somebody else, but I'm married to her. And the only difference is that in country and western, you don't have, in country and western, dogs and trucks are mentioned. In 17th century Italian music, you do not find dogs and trucks mentioned very much. Anyway, so, so we have these two different styles, and they're kind of, um, they're both existing at the same time. So it's not even a fair thing to say that, oh, well, we have this old style, and then suddenly there's a shift. So in tonight's program, you will be hearing a lot of music that has elements of both. And you will hear some things that are very clearly in this new style. Another thing, another aspect of music in the new style is the development of basso continuo. So what, for example, what the, what, the, what the Palestrina piece doesn't have, it doesn't have a continuo part. It has four vocal parts, and that's what you get. And you doesn't mean you couldn't play organ with the, with the singers, but you don't have a separate line that is for the bass. You don't have a separate harmony line. But for example, then you also hear a sacred piece by Frescobaldi, which is uh, Ave Virgo Gloriosa, which is again for four voices and basso continuo. If you took away the continuo part, it might sound quite similar to Palestrina, but not quite as busy not quite as dense. But the minute you get a basso continuo part, it means you're calling for instruments, and these instruments are responsible for playing this bass line and playing harmonic support that goes with the other four vocal parts. And the bass voice, when the bass voice is singing, he's doubled by the continuo, but the continuo often goes off by itself where the bass voice has, you know, three bars where he's not singing. So it's this, and you will find in other pieces, for example, in all the solo arias you will hear tonight, there are continual parts. This is also one of the elements of the new style where we get a kind of a polarity between upper voice and bass voice. Um, we, don't, we don't have a polarity where you sort of have four voices and they kind of mix like this, and sometimes you can't hear who's on top and who's beneath. It's hard to sort of pick out the voices. In solo arias and in the canzonas as well, it's fairly easy to hear. There's a top voice and there's a supporting bass line, which doesn't mean that the bass line is less important, but its job is the kind of the navigator. And the upper voice is the, with the text, so telling you the story, but if it wasn't for that bass line, they wouldn't be able to tell you the story so fully. And especially when you have solo pieces, whether they are sacred or whether they are secular texts, um, you get more opportunity for word painting because you have one person singing a text, one person declaiming, one person telling the story. And so, for example, in the first solo piece you'll hear, which is a solo motet, which is basically, it's like a solo aria, it just has a sacred text. Um, so you'll hear, O Jesu mi dulcissime, so my sweetest one. And so there's a kind of a sweetness in the text, there's a kind of a lingering on long notes. So somebody is really adoring this person, Jesus. And then, for example, talk about sweeter than honey, you'll hear something where the lines are really quite beautiful and, and slow moving. And then when there's talk about more ardor, I long to serve you, you have more figured movement in the music. And of course, it's a good piece if you vary these things from, from one thought to the next. It's the same thing as we've all had, uh, for example, we've all had a professor in high school or university who's speaking. Uh, they could have been the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable person in the world on the subject but they are a crashing bore to listen to, and it's because their voice, there's no inflection in the voice, and there seems to be no pleasure in saying what they're saying. 
but, uh, but all these songs, one takes pleasure in the text and one sings it accordingly. Um, so if you can compare as you're listening, Palestrina with the Frescobaldi Ave Virgo, which you will hear in the second half. And then also the first piece you hear after the organ solo is this O Jesu Mi Dulcissime. So this solo part, and just see if you can to see how Corey is, is making use of this text and what he's doing with it, which is also why I'm saying if you have a look at the texts before the show, it's a good idea because then you can get more of this. Um, then you also have group pieces. So you have for five voices, madrigals. So you're going to hear five Frescobaldi madrigals and one madrigal by Marenzio, who was a contemporary of his. I also thought about putting some Gesualdo on but uh, maybe that's for the next one. That's round two. Um, anyway, fantastic dissonances that are also used. And you will hear more of them um, from Marenzio than you hear from Frescobaldi. I thought actually it would just sort of show you what I mean by dissonances, because lots of people wonder what that means. When you hear it, you go, oh, OK, I know what that is. But sometimes people don't know. And I have a rather unorthodox way of doing it. So a dissonance occurs when you have two notes that don't fit together very well. But the great thing about dissonances is, is that when you resolve them, the resolution is so much better than if you just play, uh, just play a nice harmony by itself. So if we have... That's not really in tune, but anyway. So if I play something that is in a, an interval we think sounds nice, two notes that sound nice together. You can hear that. But if I do this. Right? That's kind of like sort of waiting for somebody to resolve. So when you are talking about the pain you cause me because you don't love me, okay, the, the dissonance is pain, and the consonance, the resolution, is the end of the sentence. Even if your, your, your sadness is not resolved, at least the harmonic dissonance is resolved. So this is something that they love to use for all kinds of word painting. So you'll hear it in some of the madrigals. Allow, let me languish. I am dying with, for love of you. And I, I don't think there's any hope for me. You'll hear a lot of dissonances in something like that. If they were singing about, oh, isn't it a lovely day? And let's go take a walk in the meadow. And great, no, it's just, it's just so great. You're not going to hear a lot of dissonances in that because that's not. Uh, a happy day in the meadow doesn't have a lot of dissonances. It's only when the weather starts to get bad, then you get dissonances. So if you see the clouds come in, dissonance. And then when the sun comes out again, resolved, not so many dissonances. It's an it's important thing. And so it's kind of like musical word painting. It's very, very abstract, but that's what it is. Um, there's another kind of uh, ensemble piece. We have two examples of what's called a villanella which is more of a folky song. It's a strophic song, which means they have verses. It's recognizable. It's probably something that you could walk out humming. You just have to hear it once. It's kind of like everything that you heard on the radio in the, in the 60s and 70s and 80s. Well, the songs, anything that Lennon McCartney wrote has verses. And it's just immediately you can pick it up. I'm not saying that that's what they wrote was Villanella, but anyway, it's this kind of popular, immediately accessible type of music, which was also created in reaction to madrigals, which sounded maybe a bit too artsy for some people, a bit too refined, um, and not, you know, a bit too learned, but still very, very beautiful. And then we also have, in terms of instrumental music, um, we have a similar kind of polarity that you can see between the old style and the new style. 
And you see the old style most at work in the pieces that are called either Recercar, Capriccio, or Toccata. These are all kind of improvisatory type pieces. The very first piece that Paul is going to play on the chamber organ is it says it's a Recercar sopra uh, mire fa mi. And that just means just those four notes in that order. And you will hear those notes in one of the voices repeated over and over again. Sometimes you hear And a couple of times you hear So really extended, this is what we call the technical term for that, again, for answering your music history exam, is this is augmentation. So the notes get longer in value, but the structure stays the same. They're, he's using, Frescobaldi uses these four notes in a row to make a kind of improvisatory sounding piece. And a capriccio, same kind of idea. And then you'll hear Esteban play a toccata for chitarone. And it's the same kind of idea. It might sound like he was almost making it up. The idea occurs to you, oh, this would sound nice. And then you have an idea, you imitate the idea a few times, just to be organized, and then you move on to another idea. On the other hand, the two other types of pieces you have for instruments, you will have the canzona, which is an early form of sonata. So it's an early uh, instrumental piece. There's a treble voice and a bass part. And it's kind of fun, I'm really happy we're doing this because there actually will be three people playing the continual parts and so they've been able to mix things up in terms of the colors that you hear within the piece. Um, so it is, it will be either harpsichord or organ, chitarone and cello are playing these, this part. And then the other part that we have is, is dance music. And I thought it's important to include that because obviously Frescobaldi knew about dancing and he also used a lot of dance basses in a lot of his arias and his um, instrumental pieces, where you just repeat, you have a bass line that is repeated over and over again. The most famous one for us today is probably the folia bass. But there are many other basses that are quite um, familiar to people, and we are improvising them tonight. Most of what you hear in the, bass, the dan dance bass pieces will be improvised. Um, I'd also like to just make a couple of points. First of all, just make sure that you know the pictures. A lot of them were taken by a, um, a guy, a photographer who's based in Prague right now. And uh, also Laura Warren found a number of other pictures. And so we've tried to mix old pictures with new pictures photography with images of historical things in Rome. So it's not quite a travelogue, but it's a little bit kind of as things come to us, what the, what the music suggests to us. And I think Laura's done a fantastic job of putting things together for that. And I'd also just like to make a point that the chamber organ that we're using tonight is made by Tom Lincoln in Toronto. He is a Toronto-based builder of organs. And this is a little based on historical models with also, if you come up and look, have a look, it has beautiful little um, oak design, oak leaves and acorns. So I just thought that was worth, you should all know that this instrument was built here. So um, I hope what I've told you tonight will give you some, uh, a little bit of sort of extras, things to listen for, ideas to go away with, and I really hope you enjoy the show. It's been really wonderful for us putting it together. It's an entirely new show for us, all the pieces you hear. This is the first time we're performing them. And uh, we've had a blast putting it together, so I hope you enjoy listening to it, and thanks for coming.